we're going to move uh, into, frankly, the panel I've been looking to uh, most, looking forward to most today. We have some really interesting speakers to talk about a subject that I think hits on a, a lot of the questions uh, that, that I asked at the start of the conference. This is the location discovery panel. The improbable business of having people tell you exactly where they are at all times so they can sell you to advertisers. Uh, really interesting, uh, and I'm hoping that today, if nothing else, we can answer the question, what do these people do when it's not South by Southwest? So, <laughs> welcoming to the stage, we now have uh, Shandy Race, technology reporter for the Wall Street Journal. She'll be joined by Bill Nguyen, uh, founder of Color, Holger Ludorf, vice president for business development at Foursquare, and Paul Davison, CEO of Highlights. So what do you guys do when it's not South by Southwest? <laughs> no, I've never Work. been to South by Southwest. <laughs> um, thanks so much for coming, guys. Uh, so Bill, I want to start with you, because you were sort of a pioneer in this space when you first launched Color. I'm and a canary in a coal mine. You <laughs> And you came up with this idea of letting people know who is around you all the time. Um, but you've since moved away from that. So can you start out by kind of giving us a little history about how you came up with this idea, why you thought people would like it, and then why you decided that you didn't think people liked it? I still think people will like it. You know, I think the, the challenge of all this stuff is that you're trying to change social norms. And it, it's hard to get people to change social norms. They want something in return for it. So I, I came up with this analogy. I thought, you know, there's this amazing place and it's sunny and there's sand and everyone's having a great time. And that's how I would convince my friends to come to the beach, right? It's not, I wouldn't say, you have to go half naked to this place, <laughs> right? So I, I think the challenge is like right now, like I was playing with airtime last night. Like, I want to like it, but like, I didn't know if I should put on a good looking shirt, you know, should I should comb my hair, should I like do something? And, and so I just kept like staring at the little button and I couldn't click it, you know? And so I, I think the problem is like a lot of these things, this will become part of the social norm. We will want to discover things. We will want to be connected to the people around us using this new technology. The problem is none of us have come up with a good use case of why. We haven't come up with the beach yet. We've just kind of told people to do it. And this, by the way, doesn't work really well. <laughs> Wait a second. Okay, so that is really interesting. Now, Holger, I want to go to you because in the beginning, people felt that way about Foursquare, but you guys have sort of overcome that hump. I mean, check-ins is sort of now like a thing that people actually do, and then we'll get to you, Paul, because you're like all the way out there. But so how did you, how were you able to overcome that hump? And like in terms of pushing the social norms, where do you think you guys were successful and where do you think you still have some room to grow? Yeah, no, I think... Um I think Dennis and Naveen initially were ingenious by you know, creating the game dynamics I think that we were initially known for, right? I mean, people generally know, uh, at least in the early days, uh, have known Foursquare for the game dynamics, the mayorships, the badges, the point system, and so forth. And then I think over time, as we had uh, added um, social search, explore, uh, you know, our tip functionality, and so forth, people started realizing, oh, wait a second, there's actually a real utility behind it, right? Uh, the ability for me to connect with friends when I'm out at night uh, having dinner and like seeing on an overlay you know, that Bill is actually just down the street in another restaurant and me being able to like ping him and say like, hey, we haven't seen each other in, in, in ages, right? Let's catch up. Or like the ability for me to do a social search because right now if everybody here in the, in the room would search for sushi, let's say on Google or Yelp, we would all get the same results. But based on your check-ins, your personal check-ins and the check-ins of your friends on Foursquare Explore, which is our search, uh, social search engine, you're actually able to get extremely relevant and very personalized results. And so what we're seeing is that we're kind of uh, seeing a big change actually in user behavior from the initial like, hey, you know, we're doing this as a game, and then people are starting to realize, oh, wait a second, this is actually a real utility. But another thing that Dennis has talked about a lot, and I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about, is moving more away from check-ins as the center of the app to the data being the center of the app. And so what you guys, from my understanding, is what you've been able to do over the, these last few years right. is start with the check-ins by getting people to do that. But right. now you're taking that data and going in a whole other direction. Talk that, about that. That's very, very true. And, and I think we couldn't have done Explore, for example, with uh, a few thousand check-ins, right? Because then there's not enough social signal for us to actually analyze. Now that we have 20 million users, we have 2 billion check-ins, uh, you know, we have, you know, five to six million check-ins every day. Now that's a social signal that our algorithms can start using and actually building like really interesting uh, 
you know, recommendations on top of. So, you know, I think it's in, in our case, and I think probably in case of many social networks, you kind of have to build a certain set, a, a scalable set of data first, and then you're able to kind of derive really interesting information out of it that you can give back to the consumer. Isn't that scary? Like, I just think the concept of, like, my... I think that's the part I haven't figured out, like, what the reward is for it yet. Right. Because I think in a way it's like you're taking my data and you're going to find something interesting. Well, what is that thing? Well, the, the, the nice thing is the data is not really given away to somebody else and, and make somebody else's life easier. It's really kind of mainly for you. And really the only data that we're using, for example, is um, the data from your friend graph, right? And we're using that to say, hey, look, uh, maybe this one friend of yours is an absolute sushi expert in San Francisco, and when you look for a new sushi place in the marina where you know, maybe you're unfamiliar with the territory, then he can actually, you know, or the, the check-ins and the tips that he has left will actually provide you with a recommendation in that area. I don't, I don't think a lot of users find it actually scary in, in our case. Uh, that's the other thing, you know, I think what Paul and, 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 and his team are doing is, is super interesting uh, because it, it kind of leverages new technology and so forth. We right now still feel that people are, you know, they don't always want to check in, so they, they you know, we, we basically give them the option. We also give them the option of whether they want to not share at all, so it's a personal check-in. Uh, that's basically what we call off the grid, or if it's just shared with the Foursquare graph, if it's shared with the Facebook graph, or if it's completely public and you, you, you tweet it out. So we give people kind of different controls, and people seem to be familiar with it. I mean, I think the, the two billion check-ins speak for themselves. Bill, I just want to get back to you for a second before we get to Paul. But what was it that you saw which made you sort of retool your app? You know, I, th I think one of the things is like when I was at Apple, we were really obsessed about like doing the right thing for the customer. Like Apple's obsessed with it, like crazy obsessed with it. And I think the, the challenge is as we were building color, I realized like the most valuable information that I would have would be used to sell to other people. And I just... I, I moved away more from not about because I didn't get the users I wanted. I just, I just found it not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I, I think location is going to have a profound impact on how we connect with other people. But I'm starting to realize like things like Pinterest have a much deeper value of meaning because it is I'm discovering things based on my interest, not just I'm um, you know so I'm, I'm discovering right. So I I feel really comfortable sharing my information when I'm trying to discover things because it's helping me result, get results. So like in search, I think it's great. I get really nervous as an individual. It's like, what are we doing? Like, you know, someone is, we're really treating them almost like a commodity good that we're selling to some other people. And I don't, I don't, I'm not okay with it. I, it's weird to me. So I don't, I chose not to do that. Wow. All right, Paul, I want to go to you for a second and talk about your vision for the future. Because, so these two guys sort of, in a way, pioneered this whole idea of sharing where your location is and finding out who's immediately around you. But you have this whole vision for what the world is going to look like one day. Yeah. And, I think it's especially interesting because Bill mentioned what the use case is. Yeah. And Holger seems to still be, Foursquare is like figuring out what their use case is. So explain to us what your use case is. Yeah, the way that we view it is that, um, I mean, if you look at what's happened on the web over the last five or 10 years, it's pretty clear we love to share, we love to talk about ourselves, we love to learn about other people. It's a very natural human thing. And the idea behind Highlight is that in the real world, in the physical world, all of those same instincts exist. I mean, we wear T-shirts of our favorite bands and sweatshirts of the schools we went to and hats of our favorite sports teams, and we care deeply about how we dress and how we present ourselves, and we love to people watch. We could just sit and look at people for hours when we're at a cafe. And, you know, the example I use sometimes is, is if it turns out that the woman sitting next to me happens to know my sister who lives in London, that's really cool. That'd be fun to know. But I am never going to know that. I am never going to find that out because we just don't have the tools. I mean, if you look around this room... We, we sit here, we look around at everyone, and we don't know anything about anyone around us. And that's really, really weird. I mean, you have to think about it for a minute because it doesn't seem weird at first, but that's really bizarre. That's not how we like to live. Um, in, in some ways, you could, you, could, you could argue that the web is a reflection of how we want to socialize and how we want to share. And imagine if the web were like the real world. It's, I mean, it's so broken, you can't even imagine it. Like LinkedIn would be a collection of... 120 million pages or whatever the number is, and every page would just be a blank photo, or a blank page with a photo and a message button, and that's it. No names, no links, no words. And if I wanted to find an, an iOS engineer or a small business accountant, I would just randomly message people and say, pardon me, is there any chance you happen to be a small business accountant? Nope, sorry to bother you. Pardon me. I mean, like, you can't even imagine it because it's so bad and broken that, that it, it, it's just ridiculous. But all of a sudden, this world of strangers that we live in is changing. 
because smartphones are just now becoming ubiquitous. Facebook and online identity systems are just now becoming ubiquitous. We can just now run mobile apps in the background, and that's a really big deal. We got that from Apple in late 2010. We can just now do push notifications. Battery life is just now at the point where it's good enough, and it's only going to get better. And location accuracy is just now at the point where it's good enough, and it's only going to get better. So. Um, what, you know, these four or five ways are all coming together at the same time, and what they're going to allow us to do is to take a little bit of information about ourselves and just put it into the ether, put it into the air above our heads, and, and all of a sudden, if we want to learn about the people in this room, you could just look at anyone in the room, and just by looking at them, you can know their name and, and where they work and all the friends you have in common with them and all the other stuff that you have in common with them, and, and you're going to have something that surfaces the more interesting connections around you wherever you go, like, that woman over there actually knows your mother, and <laughs> that guy went to grade school with you a year before you, and, and that girl behind you likes all the same obscure authors that you like. Oh, and your friend's on the other side of the wall right now. And, and we look at this, and we, and we just know that this is going to exist. We know it will. And, and it's going to be like a sixth sense that we all have that we look back on and say, I can't believe we didn't used to have that. I can't believe we used to walk around blind not knowing anything about anyone. Like, how do we know who to talk to when we had a question about something? How do we know who spoke our language when we were visiting a foreign city? How do we know when our friends were next door? How do we get by and navigate our day? And I can't believe that was just 10 years ago. I mean, we do that with cell phones today, right? We say, what did we do before we could instantly magically talk to anyone? And, and we really feel that if you, if you can take this behavior that we already try and do, sharing with people, learning about people, and you can just reduce the friction by orders of magnitude and, and, and let people put this information out there in this sort of ambient way, it, it just changes the world profoundly. It changes how we socialize. It changes how we, how we perceive the world around us, who we talk to, how we meet people. It makes people friendlier. It makes people smile more. They talk more. They, you know, we just think there's all this unlocked potential in the world to connect with people more. And it's not about meeting people. I think most of the time you're not really in a mood where you want to meet people. You're busy. You're doing stuff. But if I told you that you could just have this, this magical ability to look at anyone and know all about them, I mean, how amazing is that? And, and so we've got a long way to go. And, and we're, we're just at the beginning of this stage. And, and what we build is a tiny fraction of what we have in mind. But it's just awesome. Um, but OK, so to play devil's advocate for a second, I want to yeah. bring you two guys in. Because um, the use case yeah. is not clear to me in this. And what I feel like these two guys have found in their experiences, it needs to just be more than just that pure information. Like there needs to be, first of all, you're asking people to basically completely change the way we socialize. And it's not necessarily making it more efficient, right? Because yeah. like you're saying, it's like cell phones or it's like the internet. I mean, those are things that made our lives more efficient. Yeah. But the information that you're giving, the efficiency or the, the use case is not as clear. So I don't know. What do you guys think about what he's saying and what I'm saying? And you know, I, yeah. I think I think at a high level, I, I agree with them deeply. I, I think it's really powerful what they're trying to achieve. I think the challenge that, that we ran into it, because when we tried it, was that I, I'm not certain the model of browsing mm -hmm. versus search. And what I mean by that is that I'm not often looking in rooms like, who's interesting here? And I'm not trying to find a link. Yeah. I'm usually looking for something specific. So I'm, like, I'm obsessed about like gravity sports, right? So. The question is, if I could use that concept of technology to help me find something that I'm looking to do, I think it becomes really powerful. Now, he'll get there when he has enough density, but he has a problem, which is that he doesn't have the density yet, so he has to basically let people play this other I, game first. I would say that background location plus push changes the math behind hyperlocal. Um, it, it's just not enough density. It's just not enough data yet. I mean, and, that, and this is the problem we get to, which is when you, to, in order to get the data, you had to do something. Like, you've had to ask people to give something to you. That's the problem. We're, we're, I, I agree with so many of these things. I just am really creeped out. Well, he's out. connected yeah. to Facebook, though. So all he has to do is get people to sign up for his app. Yeah, the way you, I mean, you sign in, and that's it. And, and we have the same experience, too. Right. But it, it's a little scary. Because I, I don't think most people that auth us from Facebook. So for example, we were one of the first partners on Open Graph, and we didn't employ it. We did it on purpose. We, did not, we intentionally decided not to scale our service like every other normal service, because we, th we, I just fundamentally felt that people did not know what they were giving. And so there's a screen and it has all the legal rights and everything else, but I'm like, I don't think people have any idea what I'm doing with this thing. So I, uh, again, like, you know, we, we take this very long-term perspective, which is this stuff is gonna be amazing. And I think his use case is really good. If I wanna go out and meet people, and I'm intentionally going out to try to in meet people, I w I'd hope that they would use highlights. But he's saying it's not to meet yeah, people. Not, he's it, saying I mean, it's, it's like really just like, a knowledge. What if I told you it's that like, you could just, if I could give you some superpower where you could just look around the room and anytime you could walk into a room, you could look at But why do we want to do that? Because 
I mean, it it's sort of like, knowledge. why do you look yeah. at someone's LinkedIn profile before you meet with them? Why do you look at people's Oh, but that's Facebook search, profiles? right? That's search. That's, yeah. not, that's not browsing, right. it's search. Why do you look at your Facebook newsfeed? I mean, I think we're, we're endlessly curious about other people. And I think that there are other more directed use cases that you start to get, like, um, as you start to get more people on the service, all these interesting new things emerge. Like, like how many times have you been in the same room as someone and you know you've met them but you can't remember their name? We have people write to us all the time and say, oh, I was just at the creamery and I saw this guy and I, I was blanking on his name so I avoided eye contact. Then highlight popped up and told me exactly who he was and how I know. Or, or, so or there's how a good you, use case. Yeah, or how often you play the okay, name so game Okay, so it should people. be like targeted to old people who have really bad memories. I, I, no. <laughs> uh, how many people My do you know that say that's so I'm really good with names? <laughs> <laughs> like, we can share that together. Yeah, or, um, or like remembering your friend's wife's name and his kids' names when you're at a dinner party, or remembering how you met someone, or how often you play the name game with people, like, oh, you were at Stanford 04, do you know so-and-so? You can just look at your phone and see who you know, or maybe if I meet you and I have a good conversation and I want to keep in touch, we don't have to exchange cards anymore. I could just tap a button and it will remember you, and five months later when I bump into you, it will remind us how we met, or, I mean... Yeah, Holger, I want to... No, 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 I'm just... Uh, I also tend to agree with what Paul is saying. I think that's a, it's a, that's a, you know, very, uh, you know, it's a great aspiration. Um, I think the, the 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 issue right now is actually to kind of filter the push notifications, for example, and the signal that you're giving a yeah. consumer to a point where it's actually, you know, it's it's something that doesn't annoy him, but it's actually really useful. Yeah. Right. We're that's using great. radar in in our um, application, which is based on the similar technology. It's iOS region monitoring, and it basically allows you to walk through the city of New York and all of a sudden my phone starts humming and if, if Shandy, you are a friend of mine on Foursquare, then, and you are in, happen to be in a restaurant, then my phone starts vibrating, I take it out and it tells me like, hey, your friend Shandy on Foursquare is actually just in that restaurant, yeah. just to let you know, right? And that's but radar kind of, also kind tells of cool. you things you'd be interested in doing, right? Exactly, and right. it also tells me like if I'm following Anthony Bourdain's uh, favorite restaurants in New York, uh, and I want to be alerted when I'm near a restaurant, it also does that, right? But there's still um, a degree of annoyance that, you know, I get almost like pinged too much, or maybe, you know, certain cases that would have been important for me, I, I didn't get pinged. And so like finding that, that like very fine yeah, line of really not being important. annoying, but being really useful is actually not, not that yeah, easy, right? I agree, I totally but agree. I think one of the things that's great about your application, which I still use it, is that I want to be the mayor or something. Mm -hmm. So the single player aspect of it <laughs> is still really compelling. I don't think we've crossed the line across to the multiplayer experience. I, I think that's the part where I, as a consumer, and, and I just I feel like that's it's. Like, I want to get there. I, I want society to get there. I have no clue how to do it without being weird or without having a thousand different <laughs> ideas. I don't. I mean, like, if I did, if I knew it, I'd do it. I mean, the other thing is like we're still figuring this stuff out. Like I was I was getting coffee with this one woman, and her highlight went off and said that this guy was nearby, and she looks around and says, I think it's that guy at that table right there. And and I look at my phone and I'm like, yep because I see his picture on my phone. I'm like, yeah, I think he's wearing the same jacket. I'm pretty sure that's him. So she messaged him and said, nice yellow sunglasses, because he had these yellow sunglasses on. And we're waiting for him to take his phone out. And four or five minutes later, he casually takes his phone out and looks and looks around. And we wave and smile. And he's a super nice guy. He was in town for the day from LA. And, but this and, is like going telling people to go to the beach because you want them to wear like half their clothing. Well, I, you know, I, like it's so socially abnormal. Right, but but is is and she said another person to message her and said, hey, say hi to you, say hi to your coworker Ken for me. He's a good friend of mine. I hope it's cool that I said that. <laughs> and like, is it okay to do this? I mean, the way okay, uh, one thing I compare it to sometimes is, is remember when the when the web came out. It was like this entirely new dimension that had never existed before. We called it cyberspace. I mean, that, if you remember, we called it cyberspace and the information superhighway. It was like this new thing that allowed you to cut across space and time, and all of a sudden you could chat with someone on the other side of the world, which is crazy. And you could put up a web page and your cousin in England could see it, which was nuts. And, and we had to figure this thing out. Like, what, do I call this a web page or a, a net? page and what's the etiquette in a chat room? What should that be? And is it just weirdos who use the internet? And will this thing ever be used for commerce? I mean, we really asked, will this ever be used for commerce? And, and it took us a while to figure it out, but, but over time we did, and it's completely changed the world. And I think we're at another point in time right well, now I think where the this new is thing is opening up. You got to be really careful with that, though, but the problem is people need things to do with it. I think this ambiguity of I have all this technology and let's have fun, Yeah, people don't get there. And, and in a way, you... You treat your customers really poorly by doing that. They, you, you use a lot of information to try to find out what's interesting. That, that's why, again, I like we launched with this intention, and I pulled back literally within the first 20, 30 minutes. I'm like, you know, we're not going to do this. And this is the first time I've talked to anyone. I just, I just didn't think it was the right thing to do, so we didn't do it. So, you know, we get all this grief, and we didn't turn on social engagement. We did all this stuff because I just, I literally shut it down 30 minutes into the project because we didn't think it was right. And we started working with Facebook. We're still learning. 
Like, what does it mean to ask for someone's permission? Mm. And so that's why I think, you know, one of the few social apps I still use is Foursquare, because it's clear to Thanks, me. Bill. And they, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I like but there. actually, I think you made an interesting point earlier, and um, I don't know who said it, but my ex-boss was always saying, uh, innovation happens elsewhere, right? And the point I was trying to make is you were asking for multiplayer games, right? We're kind of de-emphasizing the game. The game, the badges and all that will always be there. Uh, and there's still, you know, a very distinct group uh, among I'm the user base. I'm obsessed with them. Yeah, oh. and there's a distinct group that <laughs> actually really only uh, play, you know, plays the, the game of Foursquare, not, is not necessarily using the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it as a utility. But what we're seeing now is, because that's actually probably not so well known uh, among the audience, is the fact that I would consider ourselves 80% consumer app, that's kind of what we're known for, but we're very much also 20-25% a, uh, a platform, right? A geo-platform. Companies like Instagram, Path, Runkeeper, Quora, uh, Microsoft, Nokia, uh, uh, Sony PSP, the Vita, the handheld device, uh, are all using our geo-layer to like enable things. And so just to, to the multiplayer pieces, there's some really cool startups right now who are building real world multiplayer games. There's a, a zombie game where you're like basically walking through the city of San Francisco and you basically have to avoid zombies and you have to buy swords to uh, chop their heads off. And you know, like that's, that is innovation that we can't really offer ourselves, but by making the, um, the platform open and uh, providing the APIs and access in a very secure and private way to the data, it allows people to, play, uh, to, to build really cool apps, and including games, that they can then, uh, you know. The, the, the part that, one of the social companies that I think has done a really good job is the guys at Zynga. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is that, you know, separate everything else, one of the things that Zynga did really well was they, they connect people using a game. And so I, I'm surfing, and then this person who cut me off like a week ago, I'm like, brought to get into it. And, and we get to the beach, and he doesn't say anything to me. Then he says, do you know something about computers? I'm like, what? I thought he was going to apologize to me or something. And he goes, well, you know, like, should I buy a new computer? Because, like, like farm fill keeps crashing on me. <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I was going to rave into because, you know, Flash sucks, but... You know, this is old Apple heritage. I can't help saying that. But so I was going to get into it and explain to him, no, no, you don't need to do that. But he was saying, then he cut me off and he goes, no, I have this really large family. We have this, all this drama and we can't communicate with each other. We can't do it on phones. We can't do it by email. We just yell at each other. But in Farmville, we can. Yeah. So what I'm saying is by picking the most simple, understandable use case of why you're willing to give up this information inspired all these other follow-on cases. Like they grew from this very simple nugget. So I... In a way, I'm much more inspired by what Zynga's doing than by a lot of other companies because the game itself is compelling. And where it goes from there, I think, is really, really powerful. I feel that way about Foursquare. I think there are so many things that, that I'm learning about Foursquare that I hope that they expand on. And I think you guys are doing a lot of trial and error to find that. I think it's cool. I want to I wanna bring something up that's like the dreaded word in Silicon Valley, but monetization. How do you guys... So, so you guys have kind of come a long way, at least in terms of trying new things, because the check-in model initially, you didn't really see what that value was. Paul, I don't think you have any desire to talk about monetization yet, but it. okay. Yeah. So let's talk about it though, because I want to yeah. know what you've learned, what you think is monetizable, and what is not. Holger, I want to start with you. <laughs> we, uh, we talk our about check monetization all the time. Our check-in, can you make money off of pure check-ins? Yeah, no, so we're actually, so the nice thing here is, that um, the team and our investors are all fairly seasoned folks that know that, for example, if you want to play in the advertising space, you have to have scale, right? I come from a world of, of Yahoo where, you, you know, the homepage has a billion page impressions. That's when you can start actually luring, you know, at least big kind of brand advertisers in. We're, we're talking, obviously, about a different space at Foursquare because you're, you're talking also to, like, single proprietor, long-tail long merchants and so forth. So it's slightly different. But the nice thing is, um, I think... The notion of advertising was always built into the app, right? Because specials, which is you know, a form of a local ad, was always there. We have now 800,000 or so uh, active merchants, active merchants who are every day going in, they're checking their uh, dashboard, which is a dashboard of like their top 50 customers, their last 50 check-ins, gender and age breakdown, social reach, how many of the check-ins have been posted to Facebook and Twitter. And there's luxury boutiques in New York who have an iPad behind the counter, they see Bill checking in, and with Bill's permission, they actually also see his picture and they see the last check-in, and they pour a glass of champagne and they walk up and say like, hey Bill, you haven't been here in six months, uh, let me show you our new collection. 
right? That's kind of a very great form of, uh, you, know, um, you know, customer care and, 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 and they use it for that. The other thing is they have this ability to use specials and it's a form of yield management for merchants, right? Just like hotels and airlines toggle discounts to, uh, you know, sell out their seats or sell out their rooms. Um, a restaurant owner, if their restaurant is empty, they can set up a special. Um, and it says, hey, the first 20 people who come here will get a, their first appetizer for free. Now that, check, that special is now shown to everybody who's checking in within foot traffic distance of that restaurant. And as the restaurant is filling up, the, uh, the merchant can real time go back into the self-serve system and turn the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the ad off. If it doesn't get the results and maybe it's only half filled, he can go back in and say, you know what, I'm gonna add a free drink on, it, on top of it for the next 10 people who are coming. If you have radar on, will it just shoot to you that there's a um, special nearby? Very good idea, we don't have that turned on yet, but that's- Can I get paid for that? Theoretically, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Talk to Dennis about that. Uh, he's in charge of the product. Um, but the, the point I'm trying to make is so all of these tools are actually currently for free and that's the nice thing and that's probably, and we also, by the way, we're on the opposite end of the sales spectrum, right? If when Groupon, we're talking about tens of thousands of, uh, you know, a sales force, you know, I admire them for like running this massive uh, operation. We have zero. We have like a, a team of eight or nine guys in the BD team who are dealing with the very large players but everybody else is kind of coming, coming on, the, on the system through word of mouth. So we think that there's, you know, again, I'm doing full circle now. So these, these services are for free right now, but there's clearly a value to the merchant, to the major retailer. We have companies like Walgreens, Starbucks, and so forth, already AT&T stores, all in the system, and there's a real value there. And we think that there's definitely uh, value, additional value that we can create to them and that we can potentially sell to them. You know, there's nothing to announce right now, but I can tell you that we're seriously thinking about it. Paul, I'm going to let you take the last one. We don't really care about money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I don't think it's the exciting part of what we're doing, but I think that, like, I think what we're trying to do is really, really hard. But if you can do it, I cannot think of a bigger thing to be working on. Like, you're, you're creating so much value in the world if you can do this. You're... You're, you're giving. You're literally giving people a sixth sense, and and if we do this the right way, you're creating all. You're connecting all of these people with the right people in their lives, and you're creating all of these marriages and friendships, and connecting people who start companies that change the world. And you're just making, you're making life so much better. We just. I mean, we really do believe that if you build an amazing product that millions of people love, there are so many ways you could monetize it. I mean, I don't. Uh, we're not going to think about it for years. I think it's all predicated on getting critical mass, and that's all that we're really focused on. But I think that. I mean, if, if uh, I, I don't know, if I, how much money do people spend on recruiting to find the right people for their companies? If I could tell you the next time, if you're looking for a designer, if I could tell you the next time you're standing near one, that would be pretty cool. Or how much money do people spend to find the right spouse? If someone was walk, if you walk by the person of your dreams and we could say, hey, you guys should stop and talk, that would be really cool. And then obviously if you get scale, there are like merchant solutions or you know, advertising things. There's so much you can do to make money from this. I don't think, it's just not the right thing to be focusing on now. I think critical mass is what I you're I actually focusing. forgot one important point. I think, um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah. Uh, I think one thing that will be fundamentally important on mobile, and like, I think there's a lot of talk right now with the Facebook IPO and the valuation of how mobile advertising will differ from advertising on the web and so forth. I think um, if you can make advertising in a way that it doesn't feel like advertising, that it's actually a, a real benefit to the end user, that it kind of, you know, kind of fe seamlessly fits into the experience on the mobile phone, I think that would probably uh, you know get you very far, and that's actually one of the things that we're constantly thinking about. How does how does a special from a merchant nearby doesn't feel like an ad, but actually feels like something like, hey, I want to actually do this. I want to save the five bucks uh, that I can get from from that merchant. So um, I don't know, something to think about. Probably not easy uh, to get the use uh, to, to get the user experience right, but um, that's what we're thinking about. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.